Five, four, three, two, one. Puck Short. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the One Puck Short podcast. The New York Islanders have made a, a phenomenal start to the season. Good, so they've picked up where they left off from last year: twelve, three, and one to start the year. They were 1-3-0 at one point, but they reeled off 10 straight wins. They're currently on a 12-game point streak. They played Toronto and Maple Leafs at the Nassau Coliseum tonight, hoping to extend that still further. And joining me to summarise how things have gone so far from The Athletic, please welcome back to the show, Arthur Staple. Arthur, hi, how are you? Yeah, it's good to be here, Rob. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, we spoke last season. Things were going pretty well for the Islanders. They got into the playoffs, which I think was more than... A lot of people had hoped, and they started this year in, in a very similar vein. I wasn't entirely sure where to start. So many things have gone right, and maybe there's one or two things still need work. But I thought I would just throw it open to you and say, what is the most impressive thing about this team so far this season? Um, it, it is definitely hard to pinpoint one thing. I guess if you wanted to point to one specific area, it's probably the goaltending. Um, you know, Robin Leonard put together an amazing season and you know just a uh, a really redemptive story for him to to come back from uh you know battling uh, mental illness and and addiction to re- revive his nhl career and become a Vezina finalist last year and and win the mashton trophy and and be part of a tandem that won the the jennings trophy for giving up the fewest goals of any goaltending tandem in the league um you would have thought that would have cemented his status as an Islander going forward. And uh, the Islanders kind of went in a surprisingly different direction to, to not really make a strong effort to keep Leonard <clears throat> decided to go with Semyon Varlamov, who uh, had been a good goalie for a long time in the NHL, but, but it seemed to tail off a little bit last season in, in Colorado. So that left some people scratching their heads and, and, uh, and look where we are now, barely uh, <laughs> over a month into the season there. The goaltending is, is as good, maybe even a little bit better than it was at this time last year. Um, where Lama took a, a couple of starts to get going, but, but he's been keeping up very well. And Thomas Grice, I think maybe is the, the most unsung part of it where, uh, you know, Leonard was the big story last year, but Grice mm. made 39 of the 82 starts and, and had very, very good numbers, not Vezina numbers, but, but pretty close. And here Grice has been the one I think that's been a bit better this year uh, with a full year of working with Mitch Korn and Piero Greco under his belt. Um, so I think that tandem, I think, maybe has provided the most surprise. And, and I think uh, the rest of it, the team defense maybe is, shouldn't be as big a surprise just because it's very much the same group from last season. Um, you know, I think we when we left with the Islanders having been swept in the second round by Carolina, everybody wondered, could they add some more offense? And really what they seem to have done is, is sharpen their focus defensively and turning those, you know, those those mistakes from other teams and, and the, the tenacity that with which they play defense into into a little bit better offense. And um, so seeing them get to their their Barry Trot style, you know, what he likes to call Islander hockey even faster than they did last year is probably the, the second most impressive thing that they're banking so many wins and points at a time of the season when uh, when some good teams like the Leafs, their opponent tonight, still are trying to find their game a little bit a month into the season. Yeah, you mentioned uh, both the goaltending, also the, the ability to turn performances into points. They've got the second highest points percentage in the AHL right now behind Washington, who of course, lead the Metropolitan Division from the Islanders. Uh, they've also done pretty well in net, as you said. The highest 5v5 team save percentage. Thomas Grice has the highest overall save percentage in the entire NHL right now. And fewest goals allowed, unsurprisingly, off the back of that. Only 35 have found their way into the Islanders' net. The next best record is Dallas. The offense has been pretty reasonable, too. They're averaging about three goals per game at the moment, which, again, this is an area I think people weren't sure how the Islanders would fare. They, as you mentioned, they didn't make a whole lot of changes. They re-signed Anders Lee. They brought in Derek Brassard, who maybe started things a little cool on the island. He only had one assist in his first eight games. Barry Trotz, maybe this was rolling the, the dice and trying to land a hard six, moved him to the wing, scored in five straight games, and that seems to be an absolute genius move right now, the way Derek Brassard has, has flourished on that wing. Yeah, you know, I think uh, some of the injuries they had, and that maybe is another uh, kind of unspoken part. It's a, it's been a especially at forward. It's a group that mm. that really relies on all twelve, or certainly did last year. You know, anchored really by the by the Casey Zizekas line uh, that that they deployed to really strong effect last season. 
Uh, Sezikis, you know, injured his ankle in the last preseason game, tried to tough it out through the first week, really wasn't himself. So he set out for five at the beginning of this streak. Leo Komarov has missed a lot of the time. He'll be back tonight for the first time, I think, in 12 games. Jordan Everly missed a month with a knee injury. Um, so he missed pretty much the bulk of the of the 10-game win streak. These are, you know, Matt Martin's been out. Tom Kunakel's been out. Not, not any one of them where you'd say, oh, my God, this is uh, this is going to be a real tough one to overcome. <laughs> but I think but I think collectively, with the way that they've deployed their forwards, uh, it could have been a real blow. And instead, you know, Trotz, who, who likes to roll four lines, took a different approach during the win streak with leaning very heavily on Matthew Barzal's line, leaning very heavily on Brock Nelson's line. And as you mentioned, bringing Broussard up into that top six to feel a little bit more included in a lot of the, the five on five deployment, because frankly, they have just got not gotten any power plays at all. They're, they're so far last in the league in terms of power play chances. That's another way, area where you generate offense and where a guy like Broussard generates a lot of his offense. So I think bringing him into the, into the top six where you're, you're really using those six forwards a lot more than everybody else until they got healthy in the bottom six and then getting nice little contributions from some guys you would never have thought guys like Cole Bardro coming up, uh, getting his first NHL games at age 26, scoring his first NHL goal on a penalty shot last week. Um, Oliver Wallstrom, uh, their kind of heralded teenage draft top draft pick from a couple of years ago, getting his first taste of the NHL and uh, no, no points for him in his, in his nine games, but he did, he did make a little bit of notice. Uh, guys like Ross Johnson getting a regular turn. And then uh, Sezikis gets healthy and Sezikis and Cal Clutterbuck uh, a little bit more effective. So kind of patching things together. And I think in doing so, maybe thinking outside the box a little bit and not saying, well, we signed Derek Broussard to be our number three center. And that's where we're going to leave him no matter what, thinking that he needed to get going and maybe get get a little bit uh, a little bit off his plate moving him to the wing, not as many responsibilities without the puck so he could free up some offense. And it, uh, boy, everything Barry Trotz decides to do here <laughs> on the island seems to work out well. And, uh, and so far so good. And I think even with, with Komarov back, a guy who can play center and Bardro back in the minors, I think they're going to still roll with, with Broussard on the wing. And I'm sure he'll move back to center at some point when they're fully healthy. But, uh, but for now, I think, uh, I think Trotz likes that, that top six with uh, with kind of a more of a top nine right now with Josh Bailey filling Matt Martin's spot with Sezikis and Clutterbuck. So that those nine guys are really going to get the bulk of the five on five minutes, and um, and I think it's working so pretty well for them so far. You mentioned the lack of power play opportunities, just 28 through 16 games so far. The next lowest is Tampa Bay, who've had 42 in 15 games. So it's you know, quite a stark difference, really, over over the, sort of the first month or so of the season. Is there an element of, of maybe frustration that the Islanders have had so few opportunities with the extra man? There is, and I think it's it's bubbled over uh, on a couple of occasions. I think you can go back to the game in Winnipeg a few weeks ago where, where Matthew Barzell took uh, a couple sticks in the mouth that caused that drew blood on two different occasions within a few minutes of each other, and neither one drew a call, which usually are those, those are pretty obvious ones. So I think there's definitely a feeling of why us, and I think back to the time when not Jack Capuano, but Doug Waite, who was a pretty vocal guy when he was the coach, uh, how he and the bench would react. And I think Barry Trotz has, has kind of chided himself uh, to the media for having a couple nights where he's he's mouthed off to the refs and and he's caught himself and said this is just, it, not only is it not going to help us get calls uh it doesn't help the mood of the bench everybody needs to kind of takes their their lead from him and uh so i think he's kept his mouth shut it hasn't been great um but uh, they're just hoping that they have the puck a little bit more i think that's one of the kind of the hallmarks of the way that they play is they're not a huge puck possession team out of outside of a guy like barzal they they do try to wait for good chances they try to counterattack. Um, they've had a lot of time in their own end and, and tried to keep the, the high danger chances to a minimum. And I think for the most part, outside of the last couple of games, they've been able to do that. But but the way that they play is is, is to be positionally sound and, and forecheck well. And you're just not going to have the puck a whole lot of the time to, to generate a lot of calls. Uh, you know, maybe those things start to even out as the season goes along, but uh, it, it's a little bit of a couple of missed calls and, and a lot to do with the style that they play. And, and uh, I think a lot of the talk that uh, around the team at the end of last season, like we said, was about trying to find more offense in the power play, which was 29th in the league last year and, and not very good, um, was really one area where they could pick it up. And the fact that they're sitting where they are in the standings without having had, you know, barely more than one per game is really uh, another remarkable aspect of the start to the season. 
You mentioned Oliver Wallstrom's name earlier on. It kind of feels like a, a small blessing, perhaps. It's going to sound slightly perverse, but the injuries that did come up and having the numbers and in the positions they did. I mean, Andrew Ladd hasn't even played a game yet this season, still with some lingering issues from last year. It did give them a chance to get Oliver Wallstrom in the side. It's given them a chance to get Noah Dobson into some games as well. These young talents of sort of late teens, early 20s. Otto Kavoyla has been up as well a couple of times. Maybe as cover in case guys aren't healthy to go, but he has practised. He's had a chance to be around the team. As I said, it sounds slightly perverse because it's happened through guys being injured. But has it also helped the Islanders get some of these young players acclimatised to the NHL, acclimatised to the team and, as you mentioned, Barry Trout's systems? I think it has. I think so. You know, I, I I think when you saw Wallstrom come up, you know, the plan clearly was to have him be primarily in the AHL this year. Uh, but the opportunity arose, and and you know, he, the first couple of games, especially the first game against St. Louis here on a, on a Monday afternoon last month, he really looked like uh, a guy who belonged. And and everybody's super excited for their first game, and he sort of tailed off and tailed off and tailed off until it was it was pretty clear that playing six or seven minutes a night here rather than playing 19 or 20 in, in Bridgeport was, was, uh, was not wise, but, you know, giving them a little bit of understanding of what it takes to, to compete every night and be consistent. And, and it's the same for no adoption, even though they don't have the option of sending him to the minors. Um, it, it's definitely a different approach to development uh, than some other teams have had, and maybe even some other Islander teams have had in recent years. But uh, but Lou Lamarillo seems to believe in it. Barry Trotz seemed to believe in it. I know the fans always want to see the the exciting new prospect come up and get some time on the ice um, and really make a contribution because that's sort of the way that the NHL is going is is skewing younger and younger every year. But but uh, Lou and, and Barry are certainly not going to be swayed for their combined six decades of experience <laughs> coaching and, and managing. So it's yeah. um, for all the excitement of the fans and. And maybe the disappointment when they don't see, uh, when they see Noah Dobson healthy scratched again, or when they see Wallstrom go back down, it's uh, it's hard to debate the the wisdom of Lamarello and Trotz, and and certainly with the team playing the way that it's been playing, it's it's doubly so because uh, they're not really here to develop these guys right now. They're here to win, and uh, if those guys can help, great. And if not, they're not gonna they're not gonna be in the lineup, or they're not gonna be here. You mentioned obviously Noah Dobson can't go to Bridgeport. If they wanted to demote him, he would have to go back to junior. It's something which presents quite a, maybe a, a difficult decision for the Islanders because he has only played six of sixteen so far. He's done well when he's played. You know, he's the only player on the team right now with a, a positive Corsi four. But that's maybe the nature of the beast with with the way the Islanders play now. But. Are they going to keep him around for the season? Are they going to have to come to a point where they say maybe we should send him back to junior so he is getting playing time? Even if he is perhaps so dominant, it maybe doesn't benefit him as much as they would like. You know, I think Lou is pretty, has made it pretty clear that they're going to keep him. You know, I, I think the real, the real question comes up with when the World Juniors come around, would they release him to Team Canada to play in that tournament where you do get to play a, a, quite a bit during a stretch of time? You know, it covers the, the Christmas break, the three days when the league is, is off. And um, can they risk being short you know uh, essentially he's their seventh defenseman mm-hmm. can they can they risk being without him for those couple of weeks i would think the answer is probably yes uh, especially if we get to that point in the season in six weeks time when um if he still only played uh, 10 or so games and and i don't think they're terribly concerned with the the 10 game threshold for burning the first year of his entry level deal or, or, or even being on the roster for the 40 game threshold of of service time i think they feel like this is more development oriented and they don't want him learning bad habits by playing so so much in the Quebec League as he did the last couple years I mean he won back-to-back Memorial Cup so I can't imagine there was <laughs> too many bad habits learned but I think from the standpoint of now uh, he's old enough to and he's had enough experience that they want him to learn more of the pro game develop his body a little bit more to be a little bit stronger um, and observe you know rather than wearing himself down without getting that physical you know style of in practice that they feel and, and the occasional game. So I think the, the real question comes up more next month when, when world junior rosters are, are finalized, whether they would be interested in letting him go play in that tournament and just have that experience and then come back to the team. But I don't, uh, I don't see him going back to, to the Quebec league. It's just, uh, you know, from what they've been talking about and, and how he was used in the last couple of years, I think they want to bring him along slowly. Uh, you know, Barry Trotz, I think the story he, he likes to tell is, 
I'd much rather start a young guy um, slower than too fast because if you start someone on the top line or the top defense pair, there's only one way to go, and it's not up. And um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, Barry has a lot of good philosophies like that, and I think you're not only seeing it at this level but at the, at the, ne- at the level below. Bodie Wild, who still hasn't even played a game, uh, in in Bridgeport due to an ankle injury that he had uh, in the off season, he pretty much missed all of training camp. So they're bringing him along extremely slowly, but also not sending him back to the to the Ontario League. I think uh, I think it's an interesting philosophy. I think we're going to have to wait and see how it works out in in the years to come. But I think with uh, with these three teenagers that are pretty important pieces of the future of the Islanders, um, how they manage them and and uh, how they manage the expectations that are obviously in place uh, among the fan base and around the league. Uh, it, it is interesting and, and to kind of contrast it with how some teenagers have been handled on other teams and, and whether they can kind of sustain the, the initial excitement and impact of, uh, of joining the league. You mentioned the words top pair there. I feel it'd be remiss not to to give you an opportunity to sing Adam Palak's praises again because <laughs> he leads the team in average ice time. He's 25 years old and while people were looking at, at Ryan Pollock to be sort of the number one defenseman of the future and I think maybe he's, he's starting to develop that way, Palak's developed into a really strong shutdown defenseman for the New York Islanders in the last couple of seasons. He really is, uh, you know. I think if you if you go by contract and ice time and value to your team, it's hard to be hard to find someone who has more value at 1.6 million per for this year and one more year than Adam Pellick does. It's, um, you know, credit goes to Garth Snow and uh, and his staff, uh, not only his his amateur scouting staff for identifying Pellick as a you know he's a mid round draft pick, much like a guy like Devon Taves, two guys that are playing pretty big roles for this Islander team. Uh, and kudos to, to Lou Lamarillo and, and the development staff that he carried over from, from Garth Snow to, to see these guys through to being key NHL players. And, and in particular, in Pellick's case, being a kind of guy who um, very unflashy style, very unassuming personality. But uh, but on the ice, you've see, you know, seeing the confidence grow and grow, you know, it's hard to imagine that, that last year around this time, he, he was a healthy scratch for a couple of games because the confidence in his in his ability had uh had started to wane a little bit. Um, you know, I think Barry Trotz saw a, a top pair defenseman in him from the start of last season and maybe gave them a little, him and Pollock a little too much too soon and had to, had to dial it back. And, but by the end of last season, you know, those two were the main reason why Sidney Crosby didn't have a goal in the, in the sweep against the Penguins. And they are a very, you know, the, the, the underlying numbers are not great for those two guys. They do give up a lot of shots and and maybe some chances as well but that's a function of being on the ice a lot um just the fact that you know every night it seems there's a there's a really good top line for them to face off against and in the last in the last week you know you, he's seen a lot of saw a lot of Sidney Crosby last week uh saw a lot of Alexander Barkov which uh you know to me Barkov is is a top three player in the league right now and that Florida line really gave it to the Islanders pretty good <laughs> <Yeah>. but um <laughs> But I think for for a couple of twenty five year olds to be able to handle that that night in and night out and get that kind of experience, it's invaluable. It really paid off in that first round of the playoffs last year for what Barry Trotz saw in them and and tried to give them. Uh, and this year, it's it's very second nature for them. They're they're going to be the guys that that carry them the load. Really, um, you don't really see them have a lot of off nights. It's hard to it's always hard to watch defense being played. Uh, but but I think the way that that Pelic handles himself in the defensive zone with his stick. There's not a lot that gets into a dangerous area with him. Um, and that's uh, that's the biggest compliment you can play a defenseman like that who doesn't always get up the ice and put up the big uh, offensive numbers. But one thing that struck me doing my show notes is, is the number of free agent decisions, shall we say, that the Islanders are going to have to make over the next few months. Obviously, Matt Basel's the big one. I think it's safe to say that they will pay him and pay him well and look to secure his services over the long term if they can. But... Ryan Pollock's also an RFA. Devon Taves, who's developed so well over the last couple of years, is an RFA. Dare I mention Josh Hosang's name in, in that breath as well. But there's also unrestricted free agents in Thomas Grice and Matt Martin. And Thomas Kunak and Derek Brassard maybe aren't in the same echelon. I think maybe they will be seen as expendable, perhaps, when this all shakes out. But there's some big decisions there for Lou Lamarillo over the next few months. Definitely. And, uh, you know, I think uh, with the restricted free agents, obviously Barzell is, you know, he might be the headliner of the entire league and, mm. and certainly in the, coming yeah. off the, the, the off season of the RFA this past year um, <laughs> is 
a little bit of tension around uh, around seeing Matt Barzell get get to restricted free agency. I don't think anybody's worried about an offer sheet or anything like that. But it's going to be uh, it's going to be an interesting negotiation. I don't I don't see Matt Barzell uh, being ignorant of the circumstances with Mitch Marner and, and Austin Matthews and and the guys um, you know uh, that that went deep and sometimes deep into training camp unsigned last year. Um, and I think it's going to be a big number, like you said. And, and I, I think it's more a matter of Lula Morello, who's a famously, dif- you know, can be a famously <laughs> difficult negotiator, whether he'll understand uh, or acquiesce uh, in, early in the process to what uh, Barcel's camp will be looking for. And, you know, I'm sure it will be in that four or five year range that takes him right up to the edge of uh, unrestricted free agency. And um, whether Lou is uh, willing to adapt to the times or, or, or hold firm and, and kind of maybe push for a shorter term deal, like a Patrick line, a deal to, to see where Barzell is going to be in a couple of years and just kick that can down the road. It's going to be interesting. And I think Pollock and Taves are, are, you know, Pollock is certainly going to be due a huge raise from the 2 million he took in a bridge deal. Um, I, I could certainly see something longer term with him um, just being a, a reliable defenseman, that, a, a righty defenseman that they're going to have for a long time. And I think, of the guys they have on the right side right now, obviously Johnny Boychuk's getting up there in age. Scott Mayfield is is maybe not uh, not necessarily a long term top four option, especially when you guys got guys righty guys like Dobson and, and Bodie Wild knocking at the door in in the near term. So, yeah, but I think Pollock is an important piece, and Taves, um, you know, he leads their leads their defenseman in scoring. He's he's up among the top couple guys in scoring on the team in general. Um, just I think he had a bit of a rough start uh, the first maybe 10 or 12 games. But I think in the last few, he's really started to come into his own, uh, you know, using his speed and his legs. Um, and I think the, the kind of the gamble he took on the one way deal for himself, uh, it's going to be an interesting negotiation with him to kind of gauge how much of a jump he deserves from 750. Um, you know, whether he wants to go into the, you know, the mid, you know, all, all the way up to four or five million per for a longer term deal or whether he's. Still, still something that's a guy that would be more cost effective uh, in the future. And when it comes to the unrestricted guys, you know, I think they they probably feel a lot of those guys are replaceable. I think Matt Martin has a job with this team uh, for the foreseeable future. Just he may not be a regular player in the you know once uh, once his next contract rolls around. But I think they feel like he's a guy that uh, presence in the room is is something that's valuable to. Both Lamarillo and Trotz, at least, and, and Matt Martin certainly has it as a long, you know, long-serving member of the Islanders with uh, with a couple of year detour to Toronto in, in there. But um, you know, and Grice is a fascinating one. Like we were just talking about uh, how good his numbers have been. But uh, you know, if if he, he's a smart guy, and I'm sure he saw <laughs> with with his, his partner from last year putting up uh, ridiculously good numbers and being very expendable. So. Um, I wonder where Grice feels like he can go from here at age 34, whether he's uh, accepting of uh, a more modest payday and, and the desire to stay here and compete for a job next year if, if a, a guy like Ilya Sorokin decides to come over. And obviously Bar- Semyon Varlamov, is, with three more years in his deal, is secure. Uh, or whether Grice wants to try to figure out a way to, to be a, a 1A, 1B kind of guy somewhere else and, and get a couple more years and... Uh, and and find a new home uh he certainly was well traveled before he got to the island a few years ago but um uh, you know like you said very interesting situations i think the barzal one is probably the most important one uh and if the islanders you know if, if there's a similar end to this season where they can't find themselves advancing beyond the first or second round because of their limited offensive capabilities whether they feel like they need to go out and try to make a splash again, maybe, you know, wh- whether it's uh, competing for a guy like Taylor Hall, if he gets the free agency next summer or make a trade, uh, trade one or two of these younger assets for, for a more top line score up front to play alongside Barzal. It's, uh, it's going to be an, another interesting summer. And uh, if they keep playing the way that they're playing and the expectations continue to be high, I think, uh, I think maybe the pressure builds a little bit more than it has before on Lamarillo to, to really go for it uh, in the shorter term. It's interesting you mentioned the possibility, and I stress it's only a possibility because we just don't know right now, that they may look to maybe do something similar they, that when they picked up with Patrick Laine when they come to talk to Matt Basel at a shorter term deal. Maybe some people call it like a show me deal, whatever you want to put the term, but it's the length that really, really caught my ear because 
you said a couple of years to kick it down the road. The other thing that changes in a couple of years is Johnny Boychuk and Nick Leddy's present deals expire. Now, Leddy's only 28, so he may resign. He may be traded if Pellick and Dobson and all these guys we've talked about continue to develop. Boychuk may retire, but he'll be a veteran there who, who is perhaps reaching a point where he is expendable. The point in his very long-winded way is they're going to lose $11.5 million against the cap. I mean, that's a significant amount of money to then go back to Matt Barzell in, in 2022 and say, right, you know, you've done this over the past two years. We are ready to give you the full whack at however many teens of millions of dollars. And, and, and is that going to be an important factor, do we think? You know, I think there's there's a lot of factors that are going to play. And obviously, you know, Seattle comes into the league in a, in a couple of years. They're going to lose someone off of their team via expansion. I'm sure that uh, at that time, with a year left on their deals, they would probably love it to be Johnny Boychuk or Nick Letty, um, depending on where the the rest of the roster shakes out at that point. Can or I, even Andrew Ladd. Even... I was going to say, is Andrew Ladd also <laughs> a <laughs> right, candidate? Right, Andrew Ladd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I you know, I think uh, I think they'd love to be rid of Andrew Ladd's contract right now if they could, but I, I doubt <laughs> there's any takers. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I I sort of feel like. Uh, there's other, you know, Seattle comes into the league. I think that bumps up the salary cap a decent amount. We'll, we'll probably be on the verge of a new CBA around then. So um, there could be some different rules in place for contracts, uh, whether it's length or signing bonus situations. Um, a, lot of, a lot of variables. You know, I think there'll be a new TV contract that could add to, to the cap and to the hockey-related revenue that gets split between players and, and ownership. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I think maybe the the shorter term deal is the smarter play, just because of the unknowns to come after that, and on all of the unknowns, I feel like lean in favor of uh, more cap space. Mm. So, and, and I think maybe the biggest uh, factor, as far as the Islanders go, is that they'll be playing in their brand new arena in 21-22, and um, you know, I don't think Lou Lamarillo makes hockey decisions based on any other. Uh, factors other than what he sees in front of him. But uh, but I, I can't imagine that ownership would want to go into that season with any uncertainty with their star player. And um, whether that means that you, 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 you capitulate a little bit easier on the four or five year deal to take him right up to free agency, or once you have that bridge deal in place, uh, the work begins immediately in that 2021 season or 21, 22 season rather to extend him beyond there Um it will be uh, it will be interesting to see because there's there's a lot of a lot of balls uh, in the air when it comes to the league and then when it comes to the Islanders wanting to to st- get off on the right foot in Belmont and uh, certainly have Matthew Barzell be a part of it for a long long time. You mentioned it right there. The, the last point I had to ask you about was Belmont because as I mentioned, the Islanders play at Nassau tonight. They've played at Brooklyn this year. They've bounced around really for the last eighteen months since it became apparent they weren't quite happy at the Barclays Centre in Brooklyn and, and maybe the ownership and the management of the Barclays Centre weren't quite happy with the Islanders and the, the relationship was, was frayed, just to say the least. Maybe fractured is accurate, I don't know. But but how important is Belmont going to be to the Islanders in terms of attracting, maybe boosting attendances, attracting more fans? Because attendances have still been kind of low with with the bouncing around, even though the team have been winning with attracting free agents, with keeping stars like Matt Barzell, just how big a deal is this new Belmont Park development going to be for the club? I think it's going to be pretty big. You know, uh, attendance is is kind of I hate to say it is what it is, mm. but you know this is this is a franchise that always seems to get a, a big spate of home games in October, November, before you know whether it's the Yankees still being active in in baseball playoffs or football still kind of capturing the the attention of, uh, of a lot of the fans out here and a lot of teams that come in that, uh, that only come in once from out West uh, that aren't necessarily the most popular. So there's always a lot of factors. And, and I think really um, the main factor is the, the core season ticket holder base of this, this, you know, this, this fan group in this area just has, you know, is still recovering from the, the dead times of the, the nineties and the two thousands and the two thousand tens that yeah. when, when the teams just weren't very good and, and couldn't draw very much. So a new building will help a good team going into a new building will help even more. And I think, uh, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see, um, 
<laughs> once the second half of the season comes around, as it usually does when they when they're good, uh, you know, the fans do start to turn out, whether it's here or in Brooklyn. Uh, and really, the three games in Brooklyn last week actually did pretty well. You know, there were twelve thousand or so about mm. average, which uh, not too bad for Brooklyn. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, that you know, the idea that that a huge fan base will suddenly materialize in a brand new building at Belmont is is uh, is not necessarily the case. I think there's there's still some factors that uh, are in the Islanders' hands: spending money, uh, making sure that the the existing season ticket holders and the ones they want to bring in are are happy uh, with good amenities, and also things that are out of their hands, which are you know their performance on the ice leading up to it. Uh, if they continue on this path, I think they'll they'll be in good shape. But um, it'll definitely be interesting to see where they are in 2021 when that building opens. Yeah, for sure. Arthur, thank you so much for your time today. Is there anything you want to plug or where can people find you <laughs> online? Or... <laughs> uh, well, we're still uh, at theathletic.com. You know, been there a couple of years now, and it's been such a great experience for me personally. And I think for a lot of Islander fans to just have uh, the resources of a company like The Athletic that they've devoted to covering teams like the Islanders. Uh, it's been a great help to me. And, and I think the, the work has shown it. And um, we have our own podcast, not that I want to take away any from your audience, but we have uh, myself and former Islander Mark Parrish have something called no sleep till Belmont. That comes out twice a week um, also on our site and on the, uh, on Apple and Spotify. Uh, and you can follow me at Stape Athletic on Twitter for the, the daily updates and whatever else pops into my head. Perfect. Arthur, thank you again for your time. Enjoy the game this evening. Thanks a lot, Rob. I appreciate it.